Hey everybody, this is Jim. And Jeremy. And we are on show number 23. This is actually our Halloween show. We're going to start with our five favorite Halloween songs. And then we're going to get into some horror movies. So we're going to get a little bit away from music, which we do like once a year for our Halloween show. We're going to start with uh, our five favorite Halloween songs. And I'll start off. So I'm going to start with uh, number five. And this is a band that I liked back in the 90s uh, called Concrete Blonde. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. I have not heard of them. So this song's called Bloodletting, the vampire song. So this is a good, simple rock tune. There's some uh, flange on the guitar sound. Uh, Actually, a very nice melodic guitar solo in the middle. So I like how the, the lyrics go because they, the lyrics change a little bit each time before they go into the chorus. You are a vampire and baby, I'm the walking dead. And then the second verse, you were a vampire and now I'm nothing at all. And then the third time, you were a vampire and now I may never see the light. And they talk about New Orleans. Just good lyrics in this song. Good, just good, like straightforward rock song. So that's my number five, Concrete Blonde. Uh, number five for me, uh, In Excess, The Devil Inside. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, nothing too creative. Devil, released as a single in 1988, recorded year I was born, 87. Interesting fact about this song, the uh, guitarist and saxophone player Kirk Pengilly stated in an interview that he did not like the music video for this song. Hmm. Did you ever know that? I know I've seen the video. I can't remember it. Yeah. It would have been, you know, MTV days. Yeah. When they actually showed music videos. <laughs> The uh, song was also future, featured on the film Rockstar. Uh, it's just an upbeat song that, you know, I know we're going for a Halloween theme, but that doesn't necessarily have to be scary tune, right? Or creepy. That could be on a Halloween playlist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's simple, but alternative rock type of song. So mm-hmm. that was my number five. Okay. Now, number four, I have actually two that are tied by the same artist. Because one is very popular, Werewolves of London. <laughs> Warren Zevon. <clears throat> Warren Zevon. So this came out in 1978 on the Excitable Boy album. The song that's tied is actually the title song. Now, I was um, 12 years old at the time. And like I've said before, my parents didn't really know what I was listening to. But this song, Excitable Boy, just was shocking to me at age 12. I don't know if you know that song. I don't know the song. Now, this is a darker, much darker song than uh, Werewolves of London, because Werewolves of London is kind of a, you know, humorous take on, uh, you know, with werewolves, of course. The lyrics are a little odd, and one that really stood out to me was, uh, he rubbed the pot roast all over his chest, right? That's a real lyric? Yeah. What's really weird is that Warren Zevon uh, admitted in his autobiography of rubbing a pot roast on his chest at his own dinner table, right? <laughs> I don't think he's ever murdered anyone. There's a lyric, uh, the, the song gets progressively worse, and it's about a kid who they kind of brush off. Like, he, he's an excitable boy, you know, he, he's a little bit uh, maybe hyper. And then the second lyric, then he goes to the movies and he bites the usherette's leg, right? Okay. So by the end of the song, 10 years later, he gets out of jail. I'm not going to really tell you the end of the song. Uh, and it is in the genre of a, what's a murder song. But what I found frightening was this is written about a person where, you know, werewolves of London's written about werewolves. Do they really exist? Of course they do. Or do they, you know? Well, you have silver bullets in your closet. <laughs> That's my number four, like I said, tie between both of those songs. So th- those will be good for a... A playlist. So now we're up to six songs? Is that what's going on here? No, that was number four. Okay. It was 4A A and 4B. Yeah. Got it. All right. My fourth song, uh, Little Shop of Horrors, Feed Me. Okay. Get it. (laughs) Uh, If you haven't seen the movie, it is interesting. (laughs) Uh, To put it mildly, strange. Uh, But the... There's this basically human-eating plant Mm -hmm. that breaks out into song you know, midway through <laughs> and sings about eating anything and everything, you know, blood related. 
So it's, it's a plant singing. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It is a Venus flytrap, except it's like a, a human flytrap. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a it's a catchy tune, and I've always loved it. I, the movie, like I said, is strange, but this song, mm-hmm. this song is on my everyday playlist. So <laughs> it's, it's not just Halloween for me, but it definitely has to make my top five list. Just It's like such a jazzy, mm-hmm. upbeat, rocky type yeah. song. And then it's been redone several times because choruses love to do it or musicals like to pick it up and do it. So you can hear several renditions of this song and you usually won't get any bad sound when you hear it. Yeah, it's like a Halloween show tune. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my number four. Okay. My number three is I Love the Dead by Alice Cooper. Uh, There's a great guitar solo on this. Uh, It's a great anthem, you know, like We Are the Champions. Starts out like a ballad, uh, spoken verses. There's a great line in this, while friends and lovers mourn your silly grave, I have other uses for you, darling. Yeah. <laughs> this is a song that Alice does, or maybe he still does in concert, where he gets his head chopped off by a guillotine. Oh, so, yes, I've seen that. Yeah. So that's my number three. Number three for me, you, you've seen Freddy Krueger, right? From mm-hmm. the Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm-hmm. DJ Jazzy Jeff uh-huh. and the Fresh Prince <laughs> what? do a song called nightmare on my street really yes it's a rap version of nightmare on elm street Hmm. and it goes through kind of the lyrics of freddie coming to get them through Mm -hmm. song and it's both comedic and you know hip-hop kind of combined into one (laughs) it's very unique and it's very catchy just like the last tune Mm -hmm. um if you haven't heard it i would definitely suggest checking it out because it's it's a fun song and it's just fun to listen to. Yeah, I don't think I've heard that one. Yeah, it's that's number three on my list and it's a classic as far <laughs> as I'm concerned. So yours aren't as dark as mine. Mine yeah. are not as dark as yours, no. Because this is where it gets kind of dark. Darker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You okay. made Is this the one you made me listen to earlier? No, oh, that, okay. <laughs> this is number two. Oh, man. This is called Knoxville Girl by the Lovin'. It's L-O-U-V-I-N. I want to say Lovin' Brothers. Like McLovin from yeah, yeah. <laughs> Superbad? <laughs> yeah. There's no lovin' in this, though. It's a song about killing a girl that he loves after an evening walk. He picks up a stick and he beats her more until the ground around me with her blood did pour. Then he throws her in the river. This song was also done by the Box Masters, which is Billy Bob Thornton's band. Oh, jeez. Okay. And they kind of change the lyrics because in this original song where the box masters leave out this one part where he actually goes home and his mother notices he has blood on his clothes and he kind of tells her it, it was a bloody nose. Then he gets arrested, of course, and he says at the end he murdered that Knoxville girl, that girl he loved so well. And it's kind of done in a, I want to say bluegrass, like folky kind of song. That's what this is. Uh, even both the Boxmasters and the Lovin' Brothers. Now, the Boxmasters version is even a little more haunting at the end with like a whining guitar sound and then an, an echoing Billy Bob Thornton saying, don't kill me, don't kill me. That's how it ends. <laughs> so they made it a little bit even more creepier. Wow. And this is a really old song. My My number one, which you'll find out, is also another old song yeah murder song (laughs) that goes with halloween though absolutely i mean you could have a happy halloween song yeah like jeremy yeah yeah like show tunes but show tunes gotta do it uh number two for me though we're gonna get a little i mean this is a little bit darker alice cooper welcome to my nightmare okay the uh you know self-titled track off of the album inspired the nightmare tv special a worldwide concert tour in 75 and his welcome to my nightmare concert film in 76 uh, one of those tours, uh, most of Lou Reed's band actually joined in with Alice really? Cooper. Yes. <laughs> yes. That was the interesting little fun. That thing. sounds odd. If you've never seen the artwork for this album, it's kind of creepy. And then the song, it was composed by guitarist Dick Wagner for his late sixties band, The Frost. But okay. Alice Cooper changed the lyrics around and produced it as his own. So that was pretty cool too. But anyway, welcome to my nightmare, Alice Cooper. That's my number two. Now my number one, and it's by a guy named Eddie Nowak. And it's N-O-A-C-K. It might be any Eddie Noak. Um, and it's called Psycho. Now, this is one of the creepiest country songs 
ever written, I think. Uh, he talks about killing his ex and her new boyfriend. Now, he's the whole time he's singing to his mother, you know, do you think I'm psycho, mama? And then he tells her that last night he wakes up over his brother's bed. He's about to put his hands around his neck and he wants to kill both of them, himself and his brother. This gets more shocking and shocking as it goes along. He says, I just killed Johnny's pup. You think I'm psycho, mama? You better let them lock me up. And then it goes into the little girl next door. And when I heard this, it says, you know the little girl next door, mama? And I'm thinking, "Uh uh-oh. Oh, no. He says, oh, don't tell me she's dead, mama. I just saw her in the park. So we kind of know where this is going. And then you finally realize at the end of the song that he's singing to his mother and he's trying to wake her up. So he's probably killed his mother. So there's a lot of killing going on here. And yeah, the guy is psycho. This song, when you made me listen to it, the beat does not match with the words at all. (laughs) It reminds me, though, of like uh, when Weird Al would do like a kind of a ballad or happy something. But and then the lyrics just did not go with it. This is a truly frightening song. So I urge people to chance it and give this a listen yeah it doesn't the first what two three lines you're kind of going what is this but yeah and then it has a build up and <laughs> after yeah. that first chorus whoa and you're like okay this guy does need to be locked up i need some I help they find them <laughs> yes <laughs> all right my number one song uh one of my all-time favorite bands the number of the beast by iron maiden okay of course throughout the song they'll say six 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 the number of the mm-hmm. beast uh this is their third album However, this album was the first to feature Bruce Dickinson for vocals. Oh, okay. And it was also their last album with drummer Clive Burr. So if you haven't heard it, it's a hard rock, you know, kind of heavy guitar song. Mm -hmm. And then obviously they're referring to the devil all throughout the song. Yeah. Now that's the name of the album? Yes. Does that have Run Run Through the Hills on it? I'm not sure if that's the same album, but I believe that one's on there too. That was like my first album, Byron Maiden, that I bought. It is on there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. that's, that's actually one of my favorite songs, mm-hmm. but that one doesn't work for Halloween. So yeah. I, Number of the Beast is what we go with okay. for number one for me. So that does it for our five favorite Halloween songs. So you guys can make a playlist out of that. So next up, we're going to go into some Halloween movies. We're going to sway away a little bit from music. Now, mine are a little bit maybe unknown movies. I mean, you can find them, but maybe you haven't heard of them. They're not the real popular, you know, like the Chucky movies or Friday the 13th. I really love the old black and white, even the sci-fi horror movies. So I'm going to start off with my first one, and it's called Blood of Dracula. It's from 1957. Now, there's neither blood... Or Dracula in this movie, by the way. (laughs) The movie starts out on a rainy night, and a character named Nancy, she's played by Sandra Harrison, she's being driven to a boarding school. The car skids off the road, and she has an argument with her father and and her soon-to-be stepmother. It seems they want to get away, and they think it's best that Nancy doesn't go with them, because they're going to elope. Now, it's only been six weeks after her mother died. We don't find out what happened to her mother. Like I said, I love, I love the 50s. I love especially a good 50s horror movie. So Nan- Nancy gets into her room, and not but a few minutes later, some girls storm in. They start going through her luggage. They're just, you know, picking through her luggage, seeing what she has. And it, kinda, it actually kind of reminded me of Grease, 
where all the girls are on the sit on the bed and they, they don't break out in the song in this one. So you kind of feel sorry for Nancy right right off the bat. She's kind of being made, you know, to feel insecure. They find a picture of her boyfriend and they're asking her who this guy is. And uh, so the headmaster, she comes into the room and uh, she sees the room's all messed up. Nancy says she's just looking for something she, you know, a gift she got for her dad. And then she soon makes friends with Myra. Next morning, Myra congratulates her on not being a snitch, you know, saying they messed up the room. The horror's coming up, by the way. <laughs> the girls, they want her to join a secret group called the Birds of Paradise. Never find out what the secret is. You know, it's a secret group. But now it's weird because this, this is a girls' boarding school, but there's this guy hanging around. His name's Eddie. And he seems to be going out with all the, all the girls. But he's engaged to this other girl, Terry. Hmm. Right? So Nancy doesn't seem too impressed when she meets uh, Eddie. I love, I love the, the lingo from the 50s because Nancy walks away and Terry goes, what a frosty chick, right? <laughs> now, this is weird because there, there's a scene where Eddie, Eddie's just stabbing a pitchfork into the ground. You know, I don't know if, what he's doing, but I thought <laughs> that... that is anger? <laughs> I thought that might lead into something in the movie. Yeah. But it does, you know, I thought he'd rile up some evil spirit, Dracula. Yeah. But no, nothing happened there with the pitchfork. So now we get into the, starts to get a little bit crazy here. We meet Miss Branding. She's writing a thesis about her belief that there is a terrible power strong enough to destroy the world buried within each of us. Mm. So she's a little mad because she wrote this thesis and it got rejected. So she has kind of a vendetta against the school. When she tells this girl, Myra, that she is looking for a special girl to experiment with, Myra suggests Nancy, Ooh. the new girl, right? Right. Miss Branding convinces Nancy to be hypnotized, and she has this amulet around her neck, uh, which can be traced back to Dracula. Ooh. So here we go. There you go. Miss Branding is the chemistry teacher, and they were doing an experiment, and they kind of tricked Nancy, and they put some chemical on her hand that burned her hand. Very nice girls. We see that Miss Branding can heal people, too. She heals Nancy's hand. And now there's a break for a musical number. Okay. We didn't get into the horror yet. This is a great movie, though. I always find the weird, odd <laughs> movies interesting. Great movie. Yeah. So the girls are partying it up in one of the rooms upstairs. And three guys, including Eddie, they climb up a ladder. And Eddie has an album with them. Ooh. Yeah. So here's the music part. He puts on the album, and it's this song, Puppy Love. And it's not the Donny Osmond song. It's this guy, Jerry Blaine. So Eddie's friend Tab starts singing to the girls. Ooh. So there's like a little musical number. Now we see Miss Branding. She's in a window across from the girls' room with the amulet and Nancy staring out the window. And then a fight breaks out. Okay, it's not getting exciting yet. <laughs> How far into the movie are we at this okay. point? So eventually we get to the killing because Nancy turns into a vampire. So one of the girls, Nola, she has to go down into the basement to get some supplies. Now, what I liked about this is when she's attacked, there's just uh, shadows over her body. So you don't see the person. You don't see uh, Nancy turning into the vampire. So I thought that was kind of cool effect. We get to uh, the sergeant comes to the, sc <laughs> comes to the school. He thinks it was maybe one of the girls that had something to do with her death. And Miss Thorndike, she's taken aback that he wants to question them. And the sergeant, this is the best part, says, you know how teenagers are. Sometimes they get carried away. <laughs> yeah, they start killing people, yeah, they, right? Yeah, all the time. The poor janitor, I start blaming him. Now, the next morning, Nancy wakes up. She's still under Miss Branding's hypnosis. So she has a hard time waking her up. And she doesn't remember anything, Nancy. So then this is the weirdest uh, scene. This is an odd scene. There's, there's a scavenger hunt going on the next day, right? Okay. You know, so you got, you got a musical number. You got to have a scavenger hunt. It's in a cemetery. Of course. And the girls are given small shovels. So what, we're going to start digging up the cemetery yeah. to find these, whatever they are. They're Vampires? Looking for. Dracula? Well, there, there's certain things they have to find. But uh -huh. in the cemetery? Uh -huh. I don't know. Bones. <laughs> So Nancy, uh, she turns into a vampire again, and she ends up killing Eddie and Terry, his fiance. 
So and when you say she turns into a vampire, like are her teeth growing? Yeah. Or is she changing costume? Like what's what's going on? Yeah, her hair changes. I think she has a widow's peak. Her, <laughs> her eyebrows are like a foot long and she's got big teeth. Okay. She's kind of a cute vampire though. Okay. Yeah. I'd say, believe it or not, I'd say this overall a decent horror movie. I mean, it takes a little bit of while to get into the, the horror. The ending's a little odd. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. I just didn't get the message of the movie. Turning Nancy into a vampire was to save mankind where this woman had a vendetta against men. Why was she killing her, mostly her female classmates? I didn't get it. And when are the parents coming to pick her up? You know, that's my other question. Were they using, like, music or a lot of sound effects Yeah, for the scares? Yeah, when she turns into the vampire. That's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> so believe it, all, it or it not... It was all in black and white, right? Yeah. Okay. No, I, I just found it amusing. <laughs> <laughs> And again, these aren't my five top movies. Right. These are just ones you may not have heard of, might yeah. want to give it a watch, and maybe you'll like it. Maybe you'll think it's really bad. But this tells you one thing. It's available for free on YouTube. Yes. So go on there, Blood of Dracula. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're going for out of the box here. We're not going for Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street or anything like okay. that. So my, my fifth... Movie on my ranking is rated terrible on Google, just so you know. Okay. Uh, it is called Clown. Came out in 2019, mm. and they were trying to capitalize on It Chapter uh, 2 coming out, of mm -hmm. course. This group of teenagers are basically fighting for their life while being stalked by a killer clown. The movie opens, and you've got this kind of wise-ass kid who likes to post selfies mm -hmm. all the time, and likes to... he Like, he's a practical joker, right? So... He'll send these goofy pictures and send them to his friends. Well, he wanders off because he has to go to the bathroom. And he ends up in this old, like, circus-type town. <laughs> and he's gone for a while. His friends start to get worried because initially they're like, he's just joking around with us again. You know, he's wasting time. He's trying yeah. to scare us. You know, the typical kind of horror opening scene. And... This kid is kind of wandering around the circus and just checking things out because there's a bunch of tents that mm -hmm. are set up. And there's like this old ticket booth that's given out, you know, where they would give you the tickets mm -hmm. to get on the rides or go into the, the, the tents or like the carnival, whatever. So it's like closed down or? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's like it, it's very run down. It looks like mm -hmm. it's been out of business okay. for a long time. And for whatever reason, he's like hell bent and determined to actually get a real ticket. So, like, he gets one somehow, some way, like, a ticket shows up. He goes into the fun house, of course. Like, who doesn't like the fun house, yeah. right? <laughs> now he's in there, and we, we go back to the other group. There's, like, five other kids that were in the car. Now they're looking for him. And they're like, you know, stop screwing around. They're trying to call him. His phone's mm -hmm. not ringing. Like, they have no reception, that type of thing. So now they stumble upon the circus. Mm -hmm. And again... They all, like, get tickets. Like, they have to get <laughs> tickets to get mm -hmm. into this fun house, which is so hysterical. They get in there, and you don't realize that stuff's happening right away, but they go into the fun house, and basically they can't get back out. Oh, okay. Because there's this, like, psychopath that you'll see mm -hmm. who's trying to kill them, like, traps them in there. But it's yeah. done in a way where, like, the fun house looks like it's moving around. Mm -hmm. So, like, they're constantly in different corridors that... They don't realize they're in and there's like all these different like trap doors and stuff where mm -hmm. somebody yeah. can come out or they can get separated from each other. Well, eventually there's one kid in the group who's actually got some intelligence and he breaks off. He ends up on his own. He kind of ends up being the rescue warrior in a sense. Mm -hmm. This crazy clown is, you know, trying to kill some of the other friends. He kills some of them, but then he kidnaps other one, others and, like, holds them hostage. So he ties yeah. them up, tapes their mouth shut, and he puts on, like, these old home movies of, like, how he was treated as a kid huh. and makes them watch these <laughs> before taking the next step of doing whatever he's going to do. Mm -hmm. So he's showing these movies, and the, the rescue warrior, the, the one guy who is on his own, he kind of can see what's going on, but he's not letting himself be seen, obviously. He's able to kind of do his thing, tries to rescue them. I'm not mm -hmm. going to ruin the ending, mm -hmm. but the whole time, like, this 
I assume it's a clown because it's dressed up in makeup and like a wig mm-hmm. and stuff, but it's like just a psycho guy who's just getting off on killing kids. Yeah. So it, like I said, it's got a poor Google review, but for mm-hmm. me, it, it kept me fascinated. Like the entire time I was like, what's mm-hmm. going to happen next? And yeah, I really enjoyed the movie. So clown oh. 2019, <laughs> check it out. They're coming to get you, Barbara. To win two tickets to Chiller Theater in Parsippany, New Jersey, your secret word is Chucky. Just email us at Podcast at gmail.com, and I will be picking a winner on October 24th. This is for admission to Chiller Theater Autograph Show. Tickets are valued at $30 each. Now my next one, we're going a year later, 1958 couple years later called monster on campus i think i may have heard or seen this one actually now troy donahue is in this he was big in the i guess the 50s 60s and juliana moore who is tatum o'neill's mother there was no money no money was spared on the props you know like the star of the movie which is a fish a fish yeah it's a I'm not going to say this right. Cola canth fish. Okay. I have not seen this. <laughs> it's, it's an ancient fish, and there's also a giant dragonfly in the movie. Nice. Okay. Do you have to be on so drugs I'm, I'm, while you're watching this? So I'm kind of joking because th- this was the, probably the most money they spent in the movie was mm-hmm. on these two props. Okay. Right? <laughs> Dr. Donald Blake, he's the character, is the science professor at the campus, and he acquires this fish. So a truck pulls up with the fish and they open the door and we see that the ice is melting around the fish, which is in, I think, a crate. And the water runs onto the ground. Well, a dog comes over and I think it it might be his dog or someone else that works there. And he starts drinking the water and soon the dog turns violent. They have to put him in a cage. So you kind of get an idea that something's going on here. Like, he didn't touch the fish, he drank the water that was around the fish. Now, the fish is dead, it's not, like, alive okay. either. So, the, the doctor, he's moving the fish, and he puts his hand in the water, and he soon turns into, like, a monster, like a, almost like a caveman. There's no makeup involved in this, it's, it's a bad mask hmm. that he's wearing. <laughs> okay. He's not supposed to be just putting on a mask, he's actually supposed to transform into this monster. <laughs> The doctor's assistant, Molly, who kind of has a crush on him, she offers him a ride home. No, wait a minute. He, let me back up. He doesn't turn into the monster yet, right? Right. Got ahead of myself here. She offers him a ride home. He soon starts feeling ill. And before you know it, something happens to Molly. And they find Molly. This is the weirdest thing. Molly's hanging in a tree by her hair. Oh, like, that sounds painful. Yeah, I'm always freaked out by the the black and white and the 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 bad special effects. Sometimes freak me out more. Like this dragonfly, I don't even know if the wings on it are moving, but it's just flying around and it's freaking huge, right? <laughs> so this dragonfly gets into the lab. I don't know how the dragonfly ends up. Maybe the dragonfly drank the water too, or something, and he becomes like. I don't know, 20 times its normal size. It's like, it's huge. And they're trying to catch it. And the doctor ends up stabbing it. As the doctor's taking a blood sample from the dragonfly, the blood, this is the grossest thing to me. The blood drips into his pipe and then he ends up smoking it. And you can tell when he's smoking it, he's tasting something funny. But the taste of blood to me has always been disgusting to me. Yeah. So to see this blood drip into his pipe, that's pretty frightening to me. Now, what really bothered me, there's a door outside the lab that says use other door. I watched every time and they never use the other door. (laughs) They always went through this door and that like really bothered me. So then the doctor eventually realizes that he's been the one doing the killings. He doesn't realize he's turning into this caveman creature. So he's like Jekyll and Hyde? Yeah, sort of. Okay. Warning, Jim is about to spoil the end of the movie, so please fast forward if you don't want to know the ending. So he ends up injecting himself one last time to turn into the caveman, and these two detectives, 
they basically he he runs off they they end up catching up with him and and shooting him uh so it pretty much ends up like the wolf man they kind of don't know who he is until he transforms back to himself it's kind of a, another odd movie but I actually enjoyed this one to see where it went even though the looked like a guy wearing a bad mask <laughs> I love that your movies are way out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mine are like, my first one was out there, but some of these other ones, I feel mm -hmm. like everybody's going to be like, yeah, I've seen these before. <laughs> so that was Monster on Campus. This one I actually have the DVD for, by the All way, because right. I have this sci-fi horror movie set. But you can get this on Tubi, probably Amazon Prime. Nice. If you want to watch it. I'd watch the trailer first. <laughs> <laughs> my number four is a lot more well-known. David Copperfield was in it. And of course, oh, the really? Scream Queen herself, Jamie Lee Curtis. Okay. So for me, Terror Train. Everybody, you know, is obsessed with Halloween when it comes to Jamie Lee Curtis. But uh, just a couple of years, what, later? 1980, Terror Train came out? I don't think I've seen that. Really? Yeah. So it starts off, you see these college kids basically hazing a kid. Mm -hmm. And he's like super scared, super shy. They pull it off finally, and the, the kid is, like, traumatized big time. Like, he goes to a mental institution to mm -hmm. kind of get over it. Well, he never really gets over it. And mm -hmm. we'll find out later that those who played the prank on him are going to have a big Halloween costume party mm -hmm. on a train. And, of course, he's going to be on there. So a little revenge. Yes, maybe. and that's, that's what it's about the whole time. The kid who gets pranked at the beginning, who goes through the trauma, he ends up... Warning, Jeremy is about to tell you the premise of the movie. If you don't want to know, please fast forward. I don't want to ruin the movie, but he ends up being the killer. He dresses up like the people that he's killing off. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yes. So each time, like, the next kill comes, they think it's... So they're in costume. Yes, they're all okay. in costume. That's, that's a good so premise. So they'll think that it's so-and-so instead of mm -hmm. actually who it is. They should remake that movie. They probably one. should, and they yeah. probably could. Terror on the Orient Express. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have two train movies in my list. Yeah. Totally coincidental. Mm -hmm. But the whole movie, you know, you see them, see the kids partying. It's a typical college. You're not on a dorm, but you're on a train. Mm -hmm. But the whole time, you're, you almost kind of forget about that opening scene because you're watching it. And just wondering what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Because it's just kind of bizarre and off the wall. And yeah. The idea came from a dream that Daniel Grodnick had. One of the... Is that the writer? Yes. One of the foleys of the film is the train passes the same ice-encrusted curve so many times throughout the film that you can mm -hmm. actually tell that it's the same thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, this is a great one because I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis plays a great role. When she's the, you know, lead, just in general, you get kind of entrapped in her Halloween performance. This one, it's something different where she doesn't have to be the focus of the film the whole mm -hmm. time. Like, yeah, everybody else can kind of take some of that off of her. So and it's kind of cool. They're on a train, so you're not going to be able to escape. Right. You can't either. get away. There's yeah. no way to get off. Yeah, yeah exactly. But That's they also cool. don't know. So they do a great job of depicting that something's happening but not depicting to the characters that something's happening. Most of the time throughout the film, they don't even realize that people are missing okay. because everybody's drinking and partying oh, and yeah. having a good yeah. time. So you don't realize that people are dead until you finally start to get maybe three quarters of the way through. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you start putting the pieces together and now you've got your horror movie. Yeah. So it's definitely worth a watch in my opinion. So my next one, it's actually a trilogy, but I'm not going to go in the, I won't go into each one. Was this know. 1960? 1962. Now, these are ones I've seen before, and I really, I, I love Vincent Price. Are we still in black and white, or are we in color now? This is in color. All right. So this is Tales of Terror. Now, these are short, three short movies based on Edgar Allan Poe stories. Oh, nice. Well, I also love Edgar Allan Poe. Yes, so do so I. each movie is about 30 to 40 minutes long. Now, it's also directed by Roger Corman. He di directed some other Edgar Allan Poe stories. And the screenplay was written by Richard Matheson. Now, Richard Matheson, he wrote I Am Legend, and he also wrote a couple Twilight Zone episodes, namely the one uh, where William Shatner is in a plane 
there's a creature on the wing. Yeah, I was going to say, we're talking the original Twilight Zone, yeah, yeah. not the USA yeah. remake. I'm a fan of Richard Matheson. He He's written some good stuff. And uh, like I said, he did the screenplay for this. So the theme, there's a theme to these. Uh, these are movies. The movies are about death in different forms. So the first movie is Morella. And at the beginning of each movie, Vincent Price does a little narration. So this one, it's uh, what happens at the point of death, what happens after, what happens when someone doesn't stay dead. Okay. Like Morella, he says. His daughter comes to visit her father uh, after what seems like a long time. And it's a decrepit mansion. There's cobwebs all over the place. So I, lo- I love this. It's, it's like an old, you know, old house, big house that Vincent Price is living in. So the mother had died. So her father has kept her mother's corpse in the bed, which she discovers. Now it's her totally m- normal. Now, her mom apparently died while giving birth to her. Now, the father blames the daughter, Lenora, for her death. So, her mom takes Lenora's life. Like, she actually takes her life and she becomes alive again. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Then she burns down the house. This is a good... This is actually... I like these because they're short. Mm -hmm. Short and sweet, you know? Right. Now, the next one is probably the best one out of the three. The Black Cat. And if you know this story, this is a great story. And of course, this is what happens before death. And uh, Vincent Price says, a story of a man who hated a cat. You've got Peter Lorre and Vincent Price in this, which is great. Peter Lorre plays uh, Montresor Herringbone. And one night uh, while he's going about the town, he happens upon a wine tasting event. And he challenges the world's foremost wine taster, Fortunato Lucrezzi, which is Vincent Price, to a contest. Now, this is the best scene in the movie because Herringbone, he's already drunk when this happens. But Vincent Price and his facial expressions in this movie are in the scene while he's tasting the wine. He's like slapping his lips. He's sniffing the wine. I don't know. It's just it's it's in the middle of a like a horror thing, you have really good comedy. Like you're, you'll crack up at, the, at this scene, this wine tasting scene. Now, Herringbone, we think, is an amateur at wine tasting and because uh, Lucrezzi points out his most unorthodox method of tasting. And Peter Lorre says, you do it your way and I'll do it my way. So we have Vincent Price um, sniffing the wine, swooshing it around in his mouth. Well, Peter Lorre is just drinking the wine, <laughs> and guessing the year, the region that it was made, all that. Nice. Eventually, Herringbone comes to find that his wife, Annabelle, uh, oh, this is another humor scene. Herringbone, he comes home and he finds his wife, Annabelle, making the bed, which is in disarray. And he asks her if she has been exerting herself. <laughs> and then he goes on to call her a dirty trollop. So he knows she's been sleeping with someone else. Right. Right. I also wanted to mention that each of these starts with a still image and then goes into the motion and it ends that way too. Like the end of the movie, it'll look like a drawing or maybe even the scene. And then it starts and then it becomes animated, you know, Mm -hmm. like real motion. Right. I think this was the first time that maybe they did this. And it also, I think, Creepshow, the movie Creepshow. I love Creepshow. I think they got that idea maybe from this movie. Okay. So I I just, like I said, I I love that Vincent Price and Peter Lorre, they kind of play off each other in this movie. Um, Herringbone pulls out, he invites uh, Lucrezia over to the house. And I think he kind of surmises that he's having an affair with his wife. So he pulls out this very expensive bottle of wine and he says he's saving it for a special occasion. And Lucrezzi asked, what is it? And Herringbone says, your death. And then you find out he poisoned the wine. Yes. Okay. The reason it's called Black Cat, there, of course, is a cat that is Annabelle's cat that he doesn't like. Warning, Jim is about to spoil the end of the movie. So please fast forward if you don't want to know the ending. Lucrezzi finds himself 
in the basement and behind this wall that herringbone is starting to brick up and Annabelle is next to him and she appears to be dead. So the police come over because they're missing, of course, and they uh, suspect that herringbone might have something to do with this. And uh, of course, we hear a cat. Where's the cat? Well, the cat is behind the wall. So they start tearing at the wall. You know, he didn't build the wall that great, I guess, because they just start tearing at the wall. Yep. No tools or anything. And they find the bodies behind the wall. And the cat is on Annabelle's head. So that is the black cat. And that's a great story, Edgar Allan Poe. Yes, it is. So I really like that. And like, I'm going to say again, Vincent Price, Peter Laurie are just great in that. Now, even though I've seen these, the, the reason why I didn't remember the last one and uh, it's called The Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar. I remember seeing a movie with Vincent Price where he was in bed and he was dying. He was between life and death and he was being hypnotized. And I'd realized that this is one of the movies in this trilogy. It's the last one. Uh, that has Basil Rathbone. He was also in the Sherlock Holmes movies. Basically, Vincent Price is... Uh, He's not doing well uh, health-wise, and the hypnotist is trying to relieve his pain. Eventually, Vincent Price is bedridden, and he just wants to die, but the hypnotist won't take him out of a trance. So this is a really creepy movie, because Vincent Price is, I think he had died, but he's still under hypnosis. So he's in the world of the, the dead, not the living. He's saying how dark it is. It it's just creeps me out. I'm not going to tell you the ending on this one, but this is one of my fa favorites besides The Black Cat. Um, actually, all three of these are good, but uh, I like The Black Cat the most. I think these are available on YouTube. That's my... Uh, third. <laughs> third. <laughs> third. Or could it be six? It could be, yeah. Uh, number three for me is a movie called Afterlife. I am a big Christina Ricci fan. She, mm -hmm. of course, is in this film. Justin Long is in it. Liam Neeson. Uh, it starts off, you see Christina and Justin, you know, sleeping with each other. They're not in a good relationship. You can tell that. You don't know why, but you just know that she's not happy. He can see she's not happy. They kind of build along for a few minutes, and then they go out to dinner, where he's trying to talk to her, but she's just so emotional and not mm -hmm. in any kind of mood to talk. And she jumps to conclusions that he's going to break up with her essentially, or at least mm -hmm. he, th she thinks that's what he's going to do because he talks about having to move away for work. So she runs out of the restaurant and drives just emotionally upset, crying. And he starts chasing after her while well, she ends up in a horrible car crash. The next time you see her, she wakes up and you think that she's in a crematorium, essentially. And a gentleman comes over, and he looks like a mortician mm -hmm. who's working on, you know, bodies. And she starts talking to him. She can't move at all. And he basically tells her that he can talk to dead people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not like the sixth sense, but that... This because, sounds familiar. Because he's been doing this, this job for so long. Yeah. Like he I think can, I, I've seen this one. Yeah. He can connect with the dead, apparently. Mm -hmm. So he's doctoring her up. He's, you know, doing what he needs to do to preserve her body. At least mm -hmm. that's what he's making her believe. Meanwhile, her boyfriend, he's not quite a fiance, but he keeps trying to say he's her fiance. Justin Long mm -hmm. is searching for her and she screams for him, tries to get help from him. He can't hear her. The entire time the movie is playing with your mind it's trying to make you question is she alive mm -hmm. or is she actually dead yeah. and this guy can <laughs> talk to you know the souls of dead people there's a point where she breathes on the mirror and you can see the fog okay but she doesn't notice it because she's mm -hmm. so distraught and upset so he just kind of wipes it off and mm -hmm. then she goes back into her crematorium room <laughs> he injects her with something and you don't know what he's injecting her with other than mm -hmm. trying to preserve her body. But then he'll leave the room and he'll turn the thermostat all the way down to like 30. 
Mm -hmm. And the whole time she's naked and throughout the film, but she's not shivering or anything like that. So Mm -hmm. it leads you to believe that she's dead. You, you go along. Warning. Jeremy is about to spoil the end of the movie. If you don't want to know the ending, please fast forward. And I'm not going to ruin it for you, but eventually they bury her. Justin is not convinced that she's dead. You know, some things happen throughout the throughout the way. He gets very drunk looking for her. And right near the end of the film, he wakes up in a similar situation as her. (laughs) And you're playing the same thing through your head. Like, is this or is this not? And the concept of the movie. Do you find out, though? Unbelievable. No, you're left on a clue. You you have to kind of form your own idea. Okay. (laughs) So it's all what you make of it. (laughs) But it was a great movie. And that was Afterlife? Afterlife, yes. Cool. Came out in 2009. So my next one is from 1964. <laughs> and this is in black and white. Now this kind of reminded me, it has the feel of Night of the Living Dead. Jim is about to describe the entire movie. So once you listen to his review, you won't even need to watch it. So the beginning of the movie, you, you see uh, like a hobo on a train. And then the train smashes into another train. And then you see a car crash into a wall. Now, this takes place in an English town, like a quaint little English town. Because you kind of get the idea. The main character, he is an American, but then the other people have British accents. Now, there's, there's bodies laying around. Uh, there's a couple in a car. They appear dead. Uh, so you don't know what killed these people, and it's it's one of these. It's not really a survival movie, but it's a you know maybe we're the last people you know on Earth. Oh, did I say the name of the movie? I think you did. <laughs> I don't know. The Earth dies screaming. Uh, I don't think you did. Okay, <laughs> so there we go. The main character, he I think is a a pilot. Uh, he's they also call him Professor in the movie. So he ends up meeting two other people. Eventually, a couple other people appear. I think there's a total of uh, maybe six or seven people. There's a young couple. The, the guy's wife is pregnant. So you have that dynamic going on there. Oh, and there's a guy who, he's an alcoholic. And he's pretty much, I think he's, uh, he might be with another woman. But he reminded me of Rip Taylor. The comedian. (laughs) And his name is Otis in the movie, which is appropriate because if anyone remembers Andy Griffith, the town drunk's name was Otis. Right. So they find a hotel to gather in. And the other thing is there's these, they appear to be robots walking around. (laughs) This This is a really weird movie. Now the robots, they don't really have faces. Uh, their, their eyes are like, uh, they look like batteries lined up, and then there's a spring in between their eyes. I don't know. <laughs> okay. There's, like, different wires. And, I mean, they did put a little bit of money into the costumes, I think. But they're walking, they walk really slow. Okay. You know, they're not running around or anything. This woman, the one woman runs out there eventually to confront the robot, and it touches her, and she falls to the ground like she's dead. Mm-hmm. They bring her inside. They put her in bed and might be a couple nights later after people are sleeping and she gets up out of bed and her eyes are completely white. So she's almost like a zombie. Wow. From the robot touch. Yeah. Okay. There's something controlling the robots. Uh, The professor, he figures out that there's a signal going from a tower (laughs) to control these robots. Sounds like cell, but I mean, not exactly the same, but similar. I don't know what the robots are there to accomplish. It could be uh, aliens that are send these robots first to start controlling the humans. Like a War of the Worlds type of thing? Or to turn them into zombie-like creatures. So they just, and then they come in and just take over. I don't know. Oh, okay. So eventually they, they find the tower. Now they look at a map and the guy's telling them, you know, different coordinates and how to figure out where this tower is. But it seems like it only took him like five minutes to find this tower. <laughs> it was not Lord of the yeah. Rings long. <laughs> yeah. The one guy's out by the tower and he's got what looks like, remember the uh, old uh, Wile E. Coyote oh, yeah. cartoons with the, the TNT? the Acme. Yeah, with the dynamite. and the So he's got one of those things <laughs> to blow up the tower. 
And now he's standing by the tower when he's blowing it up, right? Oh, okay. And the robot is walking towards him, but he's walking really slow. So it could take him like 10 minutes, you know, to, to walk a couple of feet. But the tower falls and you think it would fall on him. So I don't know, somehow he miraculously escaped. So then all the the robots collapse. And it, apparently you these robots you can't shoot with a gun. Mm -hmm. It does nothing, but... The one scene in the movie, uh, the professor has a, he has a Land Rover and he runs over, he hits one of the robots and it like explodes <laughs> or something. I was waiting for you to say he had a magnet or something, no. a Land Rover. Yeah. <laughs> the girl eventually, she gives birth. This is before the tower or as the tower is collapsing and the robots, they all collapse and they somehow find an airport nearby mm. and they... You see the plane taken off, and that's it. That's the end of the movie. So the child of the goddess made the robots all die? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. They're coming to get you, Barbara. To win two tickets to Chiller Theater in Parsippany, New Jersey, your secret word is Chucky. Just email us at jimandmikepodcast at gmail.com, and I will be picking a winner on October 24th. This is for admission to Chiller Theater Autograph Show. Tickets are valued at $30 each. I'm going to throw an audible here, because I mentioned earlier about having two train movies, but I've decided that I like another movie better okay. for number two. Mm -hmm. So originally I had the movie Trained Busan, which Jim, you have also seen. Oh yeah. And that's a great zombie movie. It is a movie. fantastic zombie movie. But I think it would take way too long to talk about it. And I don't think I could do it justice on a podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's really, really, really a good, great movie. So I'm gonna go with another movie that I love, which is called High Tension. Mm-hmm. This is a film about two girls that are going home to visit family. One girl has a crush on the other girl. You mm -hmm. don't find that out until later. Basically, they get to this home that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and all hell breaks loose. House robbery occurs, a rape, all kinds of murders. The main girl, I don't remember her name, I'm sorry, she is smart enough to kind of know that something bad is happening. Mm -hmm. So she like makes the bed that she was sleeping in to make it look like it wasn't used. She like cleans the sink to make it look like there was never any water in there. And she even like goes up in the faucet with her fingers, like <laughs> all the way, you know, to the bone. <laughs> and then she hides and you see this guy come into the room where she was. And he's kind of like feeling out the bed and he goes over by the sink and he's looking mm -hmm. for the water. <laughs> And he makes the determination that nobody else is there. Unfortunately, she sees all these killings happening because even though she's hiding, mm -hmm. there's nothing yeah. she can do because it's this big guy. So once everything's done, he goes to drive away. She chases after him because he has her girlfriend as a, he kidnaps her, basically. Mm -hmm. So the whole time, this girl's trying to save her friend and they're traveling you know, wherever they're going. I don't know where they're going. They're just kind of going across the country or whatever. He makes a couple of stops. Things happen. And you start to see, it's kind of one of the first times that I'd ever seen where it's that mind twist of the main person may not be who you think they uh -huh. actually are. <laughs> and once the girl that she's trying to save can finally kind of get herself free, she's like, get away from me, essentially, because she knows that this man is a multiple personality disorder type of situation. Mm -hmm. Won't ruin the ending for you, but overall, you just have this kind of mind twist going on the entire time that you're wondering if they're going to get away, mm -hmm. if if they're going to be okay, and what exactly is happening. So, high tension. <laughs> okay, my last movie is a movie that I've, I haven't seen in a while, but I've always liked this movie. And it's from 1978, and it's called Magic. Have you ever heard of this movie? No. Is it like the Steve Miller? No. Who sang Magic? Yeah. No, they sang Abracadabra, <laughs> didn't they? <laughs> if you have not seen this, you would. I know you would like this, Jeremy. Okay. Okay. This is Anthony Hopkins, Ooh. Anne Margaret, and Burgess Meredith. All right. It already okay. sounds good. 
So Anthony Hopkins, uh, his character is named Corky. He's a magician whose magic act isn't going so great, right? Uh, he has a mentor who gives him advice, telling him he needs a better gimmick. So he starts using a dummy in his act, and it's a foul mouth dummy. Okay. Okay. So Burgess Meredith, he plays Ben Green. He is Corky's agent. And soon he gets Corky on The Tonight Show. Corky's then offered a TV show of his own, but he doesn't want to take the medical exam. And I think he's scared that he's not going to pass this medical exam and mostly kind of figure out that maybe there's something a little bit wrong with Corky and like mentally, right? So Corky takes off to the Catskills and he knocks on the door of his old high school crush, Peggy, played by Anne Margaret. He ends up renting a cabin across from the house. It's near a lake. This is when you really start to realize that he has some mental problems. When you hear the dummy talking, uh, he wants to get out of the suitcase. It's not like he, he's on stage doing his act. This is, this is now off stage. Okay. And he's, you know, he, he's still connecting with the dummy. Like the dummy is another person. Okay. Okay. Yep. He soon finds out that his old high school sweetheart, she's married. Uh, but her husband is always like off. I'm not even sure what exactly he does. <laughs> yeah, where he's off to. <laughs> and she seems to be a little unhappy in her marriage. So perhaps he's away too much. Then you really see a little bit, you keep seeing a little bit more and more how Corky's a little unstable. He tries to show her a magic trick where he guesses a card and he kind of messes up the trick. He doesn't guess the, and he, he just gets really angry. She tries to calm him down. I don't understand though, at that point, that's a red flag, like where you would just tell him he needs to leave. Right. And I don't know, maybe she, all, over all these years, she's still love with him. But he's only been there like one day, right? So he tries to do the trick again, and he's like sweaty, exhausted. And then him and Peggy kiss. So she must really, you know, like him. <laughs> uh, now, I noticed in the movie, he doesn't take the dummy everywhere where he goes, okay? There's a nice little scene of him and Peggy walking along, skipping stones. <laughs> Now, he also gets in some heated arguments with the dummy. Now, Anthony Hopkins is great in this movie. It's, there's some good acting in this, and, and it's disturbing, like, just the way he interacts. with. And the dummy is disturbing. Now, I always find ventriloquist dolls, like, frightening. Yes, me too. And this one has almost, its head is almost as big as a human head. Hmm. So, you know, the dummies, they usually have a smaller head. <laughs> And it's kind of freaky looking. Unless you're Jeff Dunham. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The head does come in handy a little bit later on when Ben Green, his agent, comes to pay Corky a visit. Now, it seems uh, Ben was tipped off by the cab driver when he dropped Corky off because he gave him a hundred bucks not to say that he was there. Right. Because, you know, he he was on The Tonight Show and maybe people, he recognized them and he's going to tell someone, oh, I... You know, this is where Corky is staying or something. I don't know. <laughs> so Ben comes over and he starts, you know, bugging him about taking the exam again. Now, I think it would have been easier just to fire him, say, I need a break. But now he ends up killing Ben by swinging the dummy at Ben. Poor old Ben. Mm. Burgess Meredith. Oh, and the dummy's name is Fats for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he's not fat. Leading up to this is another interesting scene is where Ben bets Corky that he can't go five minutes without the dummy talking. And he doesn't last, I think, more than two minutes. And then he just starts, the dummy just starts talking, <laughs> like rattling, rattling off stuff. And then for some reason, after Ben is killed, a, a cat just shows up, you know, in the wood. Like, cats love murder. That's apparently. totally normal. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, eventually, Corky meets Patty's husband, Duke. And Duke kind of suspects that Corky and Peggy have something going on, but he doesn't want to lose her. He he actually, they actually go out on a boat on the lake. There's a really good scene though in the boat because Duke, Duke is pulling in something and you can tell Corky's getting really nervous and agitated. uh, And he, he just wants them to, to go back 
and you think because Ben Ben eventually made it into the river. Corky put him in the river, right? So you think he's pulling up Ben's body, but no, it's a tree branch. Yeah. So I thought that was great. Like you're anticipating that he's going to find out that he killed Ben. So of course, eventually Corky kills Duke. Of course. Now, Peggy decides she, she does want to go off with Corky, but she wants to make it right and do the right thing and to let Duke know that things aren't working out. So she goes back to the house, but Duke doesn't show up. And then eventually she goes, for some reason, in a boat outside the cabin, instead of going up to the cabin where Corky is. And she says that basically ready to go you know, off with him. Right. Now, I'm not going to tell you the ending okay. of this, but it's, it's a really well acted, like Anthony Hopkins is, it's creepy, like the doll. And yeah, it's, it's worth a, a watch. Again, it's called Magic. And this I got off of Tubi, which is, you know, it's a free, free app. I don't know if anybody can get it. Might be able to find it on YouTube. I'm not sure. My number one movie. Jim is going to be well aware of this. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, the movie is called Terrifier. Oh, yeah. I showed Jim my phone earlier. My wallpaper is actually Art the Clown, <laughs> the creepy clown in the movie, who is played by David Howard Thornton. This movie is totally bizarre, mm -hmm. but it's, in my opinion, one of the creepiest movies I've ever seen from a standpoint of the killer does not ever say a word. Yes. But all he does is look at you and scare the living hell out of you. <laughs> As a creepy clown. As a creepy clown, absolutely. Yeah, he doesn't speak. Nope. That's the creepiest. He doesn't speak, <laughs> and when he smiles, it's even creepier. <laughs> <laughs> there are these two girls, Tara and Dawn, played by Jenna Cannell and Catherine Corcoran. They are out and about, and for whatever reason... They stop off to get food. I, th I think they'd been out drinking or something to that extent. So they want to get a bite to eat, and they stop off in this pizza shop. Mm -hmm. And they're just sitting there talking, and Art the Clown walks in and just sits down in a booth and just sits there with a big bag. <laughs> like, he's <laughs> just chilling. Mm -hmm. And the pizza guys are getting pissed because they're like, hey, you can't just sit here, buddy. Like, you got to leave if you're not going to order anything. But Dawn goes over and she thinks it's going to be funny to take selfies and sit on this guy's lap and <laughs> make all kinds of funny faces. Well, next thing you know, the pizza guys, they're, they're done. Like, he, he takes care of them. The girls leave, but the one girl has to go to the bathroom. So she tries to go into this, like, random apartment. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other girl just stays in the car. Dawn is the one who stays in the car. Tara tries to go inside. And you don't see Dawn again for a while. You'll see her again. Don't worry, but not for a while. Mm -hmm. Tara goes inside. She runs into this creepy cat lady. She, she tries to use the bathroom, which she does. But then she sees this clown again. And now she's like trying to hide and basically get back out of this place. But this clown, you know, he's not like Michael Myers or Jason. Like <laughs> he's, he's slow, but he's quicker than them. And he's not your typical killer because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know the whole time you think uh, no big deal he's walking around with a knife or whatever but then next thing you know he'll pull out like a, a gun like it's no big deal <laughs> and yeah. shoot that off as well eventually tara is like tied up in a chair and the clown art gets up and basically you see dawn hanging upside down <laughs> in her underwear in her underwear and one of the craziest kill scenes I've ever seen in my mm -hmm. life proceeds to take place next. I won't spoil that mm -hmm. for you. If you've yeah. seen it, you know. Tara's sitting there. All she can do is watch. She tries to get away. He takes care of her. Her sister eventually shows up trying to rescue them. And she basically gets pulled into this madness as well. There's random characters throughout the film... Like, there's a guy. Cat lady. Yeah, there's the cat lady. There's, like, an insect guy who's trying to, like, <laughs> a bug guy. Oh, yeah. There's, like, random cops that show up. The movie ends and just leaves you kind of wondering what just happened and what's going to happen next. 
because the next time you see the sister, it's not the same at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so and that, there's going to be a second one. There is a second one yeah. coming out. I can't wait. And that brings us to an autograph show called Chiller Theater. Yes. Which is in Parsippany, New Jersey. Now, I've been going there like 96 or something. And uh, so the, the cast of Terrifier... It's not only the main cast, but we got Policeman 1, 2. Oh, yeah. The Exterminator will be there. Yes. Cat Lady. Yes. Um, I think they're up to like 11 now, mm -hmm. total. And the cast only has like 15 people in it. (laughs) Yeah. There's, um, what's it, Corbin Burnson's going to be there. Um, Wally and Beaver from Leave it to Beaver. It's a wide array, not just horror people. One of the Ramones. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, Lance Kerwin, he was in Salem's Lot. You know, he was young back then. Ed Gale's going to be there, who was in Chucky. Howard the Duck. One person who's going to be there, I got an interview, Charles Rosenay. He wrote a horror book. And we're hopefully going to talk to another guy that will potentially interview. He was in a couple movies and and, uh, played with a very famous person in the 70s. So we'll just say that. We love Chiller. Jeremy loves her, uh, not her, but just autograph shows. He, yep. I think every weekend he's got one planned. He just met Richard Dreyfus. Monster Mania, yeah. Chiller Theater, New Jersey Horror Con, the Pennsylvania Horror yeah. Con. <laughs> he's met almost anybody and everybody, so. I try. Okay, so that does it for our Halloween show. Hopefully you enjoyed us rambling on about movies that hopefully you'll check out. Movies and Maybe songs? Maybe you'll check out Jeremy's movies. I don't know about mine. And so, hey, I'm checking out two of yours at least. Okay. <laughs> and if they're on YouTube, I might check them all out if they're free. <laughs> and if you want to email us, uh, it's Jim and Mike Talk at gmail.com. You want to give us suggestions, upcoming podcasts, or just want to tell us how we're doing, you can email us. So we're going to end it here. You can send your criticisms to Mike specifically. Yeah. <laughs> So remember, turn off the TV and turn up the music. We're out of here. Intro and exit music by the band 99%. Today's show was produced and edited by Jim Thatcher. Jim and Mike Talk Music is recorded at, did you say, 7 Studios in Washington, New Jersey. You can find Jim and Mike Talk Music on Apple Music, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you listen to podcasts.